I wrote this uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, these guys set it to music and made it sound cool. And uh, the one thing I'm going to say about tonight is I'll spend, you know, if I have to spend three years in my basement to make this stuff happen, a night like this, then I'm happy to do it. And I'm thrilled that you guys are all here to be here. And, uh, check out these guys. I was listening to sound check a little earlier, and it was uh, it was amazing. So, uh, so, oh, come on. He asked how Storm was. <laughs> what? Yeah. Or Ghost Storm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Storm told me, I was talking to Storm Large backstage a little while ago, and I was asked, I don't know why we started talking about my glasses. And I said, do I look better with them on or without them on? And she said, mm -hmm. She said, the worst thing is when you take them on and off to read stuff. I said, well, that's the only way I can read stuff now. So it's sort of a, a lose-lose, I guess. <laughs> It's so, also Peter's 64th birthday party. That's right. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Oh, and can, wait, I forgot. Sarah, can you send a, a tequila up here for the man? We'll just take a break in the middle of this piece so you can down it. All right, Sarah, did you get that order? Awesome. curb in front of him. Bruce Springsteen cocked his head for one of those, are you the guy, Lutz? And then I waved back and he smiled. We shook hands on the sidewalk and I followed him to the kitchen door at the back of his Aunt Dora's house. Later, after I chatted with Dora and went out for pizza with Bruce, we were back on the sidewalk making plans to meet again the next day. Now I got to give you the Jersey hug, he said. He threw his arms over my shoulders. I thumped his trapeze eye in turn, and for a moment it was like, did this happen? <laughs> Actually, I already knew that. I spent the last two years researching and writing a biography that until that day had not included any input from its subject. So in that moment, my brain whirled like a macro processor, determined to take in, analyze, and cross-reference every cellular element of the moment. Not just how he spoke and stood, but also the content and subtext of his words and movements. What was he doing here, really? I needed to interpret everything and anticipate how, how I could incorporate it into a manuscript that was already two weeks overdue. I had a lot to think about, and nearly all of it springing directly from the evening of December 20th, 1978, when I watched Springsteen tear into the opening bars of Badlands in the smoky dark of the Seattle Center Arena. Anybody else there? It was a great show. I was a sophomore in high school. I was a sophomore in high school at the time, 15 years old and chubby, with no real sense of the grown-up world, let alone my place in it. But when that 29-year-old guitarist confronted the microphone with proclamations about trouble in the heartland, and the head-on collision happening in his guts, man. I heard something so raw and unrelenting, I knew it had to be the truth. And that somewhere down that road, he described, I'd find my own future. So roll out the window and let the wind blow back your hair. All the nights busted open, these two lanes would take us anywhere. When we left Aunt Dora's house, Bruce took me to Federici's Pizza on Freehold's Main Street and introduced me to his buddies at the bar. He took the leftover slice they urged him to have and pointed the way to a back table where beers and shots of tequila quickly appeared. A pizza came next, and when the time came to leave, he snatched the check. My town, my money, he explained. <laughs> when I got into my rental car, he checked rush hour traffic on Main Street and instructed me to follow him on the secret back way out of Freehold. When a, light se a traffic light separated us, he pulled over, dialed my cell phone, and told me where he was waiting to lead me home. He picked me up at my hotel the next morning and took me to his property in Colts Neck, just a few minutes east of Freehold. We talked without interruption for four hours, then went up, to the up the road so he could play the songs he'd recorded for his new album. When we got to the studio, Springsteen led the way to the control board, 
or two sets of lyrics sat in front of a couple chairs. After apologizing in advance for the volume, musicians, he said, like their music loud. He nodded to the engineer, cueing tribal drums that herald the start of We Take Care of Our Own. Next came Easy Money, then Shackled and Drawn, then an electrified studio take of American Land. I listened and read along on the lyric sheet, but mostly I watched Bruce listen to his own work. I saw him nod to the beat and then abruptly stop, cocking his ear and giving a tiny twist to a knob just to make it all sound slightly more perfect. So let's think again of that 15-year-old kid back in 1978, or let's forget him entirely and think about anyone who gets the opportunity to hang out with a childhood hero. It's dreaming, crazy dreaming, the beer and the pizza, the tequila shots, the endless conversations, the in-studio preview of the not-quite-finished album. For months, Springsteen's friends had said the same thing about what he was like in person. He's pretty much exactly who you think he is. But of course, who we think Bruce Springsteen is springs entirely from Bruce Springsteen's own vision of who he is, or who he wants people to think he is. house on McLean Street lies an empty lot that once held the home where Springsteen spent his earliest years, living with a manic depressive father whose illness made consistent employment an impossibility. Bruce's mother worked as a secretary, but the family was poor and mainstream society unsympathetic. Viewed generally as a loser, the teenage Bruce kept to himself until rock and roll sent him reeling. When he picked up a guitar, Bruce was transformed and has spent the rest of his life remembering that magic and forever searching for times to recreate it in bigger and better ways. And so the young singer took on the muscles and poise of a superhero. He became a global icon and something like a national monument. And when he bumped into a friend of mine during this 2008 tour and the guy requested an extremely obscure 25-year-old outtake, Springsteen stopped the next night's concert in his tracks to tell everyone about how he'd met this guy who had asked for a song the band had never ever considered performing live. Till that moment, of course, when he dedicated the world premiere of None But The Brave to my buddy. Ryan White's feet didn't... <laughs> oh, Ryan. Woo! Woo! Ryan White's feet didn't hit the ground for six months after that, but when I asked Bruce what the moment had meant to him, he said he didn't even remember it. <laughs> Sorry, man. I do that all the time, man, he said. That's my job. I make miracles happen. <laughs> and you know what? It is a job. A labor-centric job. As the next months passed, I saw Springsteen run his band through military precise rehearsals. I saw him have a temper tantrum aimed at a spotlight operator who wasn't even at work yet. And I saw his face go white when I asked the wrong question at the wrong time. Sometimes I wondered how much of it was all artifice. I recalled his displays of ego and impatience and suspected that maybe I'd learned too much about this guy who had once seemed so heroic to me. <coughs> yeah, but then the house lights would go down and I'd be in the audience and see it all happening again. The one-time loser born anew the lonely teenager finding his feet, the screwed up guitar player who for all the world is standing, playing, and singing, and being exactly who he and his audience so desperately needed him to be. Whoa, whoa, this train. Hey,
Daniel over here. These are the guys who actually put together tonight's show. It's all Peter. It's all Peter tonight. So we got a big night of fun ahead of us, so let's get rolling. Woo!